Hey, I'm Nick, and in this video, I talk with Stephen Law all about how he uses the Discord app with students in his church. So he decided he wanted to create community online and be able to serve and have student ministry online just like he did in person. And he felt like the Discord app was the way to do that. Now, if you're familiar with Discord, you may know of it because video gamers use it. It's an online platform for community and engagement and conversation. It does a lot of the things that other online platforms do. But Stephen talks about how he got it started, what are the different features it has, and how he uses them to kind of create student ministry services and community online. Stephen also talks about why it's more secure than many of the other options that we think of when we think of online apps and things like that for reaching people. And so you'll hear about all that and more in this video. Now, this video is part of some bonus content related to the new digital church course. That course is all about helping church leaders use online to reach and disciple more people. And you can check out newdigitalchurch.com if you're interested in that. Go ahead and hit subscribe if you want to see more videos in this series about how to leverage online and digital for your church. And if this is helpful to you, or if this is a new idea you'd never heard of, like it was for me, go ahead and hit that like button. <music> Hey, Nick Blevins here, and I'm here with Stephen Law. Welcome, Stephen. Hey, welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks. Well, tell us a little bit about you, uh, your family, and your church as we get started. Yeah, well, for me, I am loving the fact that this year I've been able to celebrate my 10-year anniversary with me and my wife, also my 10-year anniversary at my church. So I'm at Harborside Christian Church, and it has been quite the journey. It's been so exciting. I am currently the middle school pastor there by choice. I love being able to work with middle school students. They're exciting, they're fun, and they are so moldable. So I love being able to just kind of see where they can go and help them get there. So it's an exciting time right now. We are meeting online only for the time being, getting ready to try to set up for groups coming up soon. But all in all, it's a, it's a fun learning season full of change. <laughs> Well, you're very positive about it, which is a great thing. So I'd love to talk about um, this past six months or whatever, like what middle school ministry looked like for you before COVID-19 shut things down, then what it looked like on the online only, then you did meet and then you didn't meet. I mean, like, again, you're doing like a lot of churches, just lots of changes and pivots and, oh, let's not do that. Let's do this or we'll do that for a couple months and then change it up. But let's start back with pre-COVID-19. What did middle school ministry look like at Harborside? Yeah, for us, it was definitely a busy time. I feel like we were probably the most active ministry in the entire church. That's part of youth ministry, though. And we would have three services on Sunday morning for the church, and we would have three services for the middle school as well. So our first service, we have a, an in-depth Bible study. So we basically ask the students, what do they want to learn about? And we just go all in. It is amazing. Actually, these students it's incredible how much they want to learn, how willing they are to dig into God's word if you just give them the opportunity to do so. So that was our 8.30 service, so much fun. And then at 10 and 11.30, we had our actual service. We called it our middle school service. And that was where typically we would start off with some of our music from our church downstairs. And then I would typically kick it off with a welcome, getting everybody into the room. We'd have announcements, a game, and then I would preach or one of my guests would come in and preach. And after that, we'll break up into groups. And we have groups for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and the students are kind of broken up by grade and gender throughout the room. So always something going on, always changing, keeping up with their ability to pay attention for a certain amount of time. So it's a fun time on Sunday mornings. And then, and then outside you had of separate, that. Yeah, you had separate Wednesday night groups, or was mm -hmm. it a different night? Yes. So we did Wednesday nights for the most times. Sometimes we did some Monday nights. But for the most part, those were what we call connect groups. And those groups were a whole lot more simple, kind of like what we had with that 830 service. It was in-depth. Hey, here is a topic. You guys are going to dig into this topic for probably about eight weeks at a time. And then they would take eight weeks off. So it was kind of this rotation back and forth. We would do that rotation in line with the adults. So whenever the adults were meeting on campus, we would meet on campus as well. So that way parents can go to one connect group while the students come and join us. So really good time. They get about 60 to, I'd probably say 60 to 70 minutes of group time, plus a little bit of hangout in between, so. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, and again, you may not know exactly, but like the numbers difference between some of these different options, because technically I guess a student could do the 830 Bible study 
mm -hmm. one of the two services and a group. Uh, what was like the 830 attendance like compared to the 10 and 11? I imagine the 10 was a lot of kids that came to 830 or like so there was probably some overlap there. I'm guessing a lot of kids that, that come to 1130 didn't come to 830. Otherwise, why did they stick around for the last services that are coming to the one right next to it? But even Wednesday night, again, different group. Do you feel like there's a ton of overlap? Are there almost like distinct audiences? Like we just regularly had those kids at 830 and it was kind of a different group. What was that like? Yeah, definitely a little bit of all of that. So at 8.30, it's early in the morning on a Sunday. Typically, you're having those dedicated kids. We tried doing the 8.30 service as this really fun, exciting, hey, you have to come to 8.30 because it's so much fun. And we still didn't get a lot of people to show up to. I'm like, okay, they're tired. They just don't, they're not mm -hmm. going to be there unless they really want to be there or their parents are really, really committed. So that's why we made that this in-depth Bible study service. And there are some of those students that that is their favorite service the entire week. They come to that consistently. They love being a part of that. And typically I would say it was 15 to 20 students that would be a part of that service. So not too bad for something that's 8.30 in the morning and no games involved, just straight mm -hmm. Bible. So yeah. then at the 10 and 11 30 service even though they are identical services 10 o'clock is always our busiest service at our church so we always had overflow every single week so we would typically have 50 to 60 ish students at that service alone and then at the 11 30 typically it was anywhere from 30 to 45 somewhere around there now when it comes to overlap you'd have maybe like five kids that'll say hey i went to the 8 30 i'm also coming to the 10 o'clock you have a few kids that were really, really loving it, that they'd come to the 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. And those are just the ones that, you know, their parents are serving somewhere yeah. else in the church. They're exciting. Those would be the student leaders that, hey, you were yeah. here last service. Can you help me lead this game, this service, right? Sure. Get them involved. It's a lot of fun. And then a couple of kids that go back and forth. Wednesday nights when we do our groups, that it really depended on the season. Some seasons you have a lot of involvement, some seasons not so much. So that could have been anywhere from 25 kids to 55 kids for the group times. So it's definitely all over the place, changing yeah. a lot, but it was good. Did you get, I mean, you probably had some, but I'm curious as like how much, because I know a lot of student ministries where if they have a separate group night, there'd be a good percentage of their students that only did that. Like they did not come on Sundays. Uh, was that the true for you? Did you get some kids that they would do groups only or not? Because you had semesters. I'm thinking more of student ministries where that's an ongoing option. You yeah. Know, you could always do groups. You did kind of more like semester groups. So, but did you end up with students who would only do the groups and you wouldn't see them on Sunday morning? There were a few, maybe 15% of the Wednesday yeah. night kids were ones who only came to those Wednesday nights. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I want to hear about what it looked like as you switched online. Now you actually were streaming online, the middle school service before COVID-19 hit. So you were like an early adopter, right? Uh, which I don't, you know, I don't hear that a lot. I hear that a lot in church, but you don't hear that a lot in student yeah. ministry and certainly children's ministry. So what did that look like? What were you doing before COVID-19 even hit? And then when you weren't online, what did it look like? Yeah. Well, for a while, probably for at least half of last year, we were doing online with Instagram. I would have I would give one of my leaders this little gorilla pod and I'd put my phone onto it or his phone onto it and they would walk around and just make it look pretty. After a while, we finally got a little fancier. We got a nice little gimbal that helped it stay balanced. So it was a little bit more sturdy and it, it was cool. It was very real, I guess you can say, very raw. Yeah. So, and that was fun. We didn't get a lot of involvement with it, but it was something pretty neat. But we had a lot of kids that said they wanted us to be able to get onto YouTube. So we eventually found out that the church had an extra camera from downstairs that was just one of their straight streaming cameras. They don't do live stream for downstairs at all for, sorry, I say downstairs, our room is upstairs. If you haven't figured that out. Gotcha. Yeah, um, well, that's what happens, right? You start using those, <laughs> those names when that gets associated with it. That makes sense. Yeah. So we got this extra camera. I figured out how to connect that into the YouTube um, server and we started going live on YouTube. That was probably probably around November or December of last year is when we okay. started going on to YouTube and just having, it was one set shot. We could move it around a little bit, but it was a clear good shot that had the audio coming straight from our soundboard instead of just a phone. So it worked a lot better, definitely room for improvement, but it was a start. 
And then when you went totally online, what did that look like? I mean, you'd already been doing it. So you had some experience with the technology, the cameras, but now it's different because you're not live streaming something that's happening in person. You're kind of creating something only for online. What did you do there? So we went back and forth with a few different options for what online ministry could look like for us. And for our high schoolers, they tried doing Zoom for a while and it was decent. You know, some kids stayed for a while, but then they kind of faded away, had that quote unquote Zoom fatigue, right? And then for us with the students in middle school, instead of doing Zoom, I was a little bit more focused on another platform. So I had actually been working for a while on a platform called Discord. All right. And this idea of discord, I know it's the word that is typically meaning like not good communication, you know, right? Separation. Instead, this application, I don't know why it's called discord, but it was a server where I could have my students come online whenever they wanted, as often as they wanted. And they could text chat, voice chat, video chat. We didn't have to use Zoom because it was all in this one place. We could do games. I could do my screen sharing. We could host all kinds of events all in this one server. So that was actually something that I started putting together last July. And I was excited about it. I think, hey, this is going to be a great way for us to have ministry, not just here at the church, but even beyond that and helping kids wherever they're at be involved in a ministry. So I made this server, set up all the rules, all the behind the scenes, spent quite a bit of time learning, and then weren't, I wasn't able to launch it yet. I had to wait to be able to launch it until kind of everything started to shut down. And then they were like, hey, that server you made, we can use that now. I'm like, finally, let's do it. And I launched this server. And now we have about 100 of our students that are in this server and, you know, some of them are really involved. Some of them are not involved very much at all, but the ones who are involved absolutely love it. And I've heard from their parents, hey, this is a big deal. This means so much to them. It's community, right? We, we want to have community. And right now, when we're living in a time where social distancing is so important and people are having such a high priority in that, it's important for us to be able to find social circles when we're being socially distant. And that's what this platform has allowed us to do. So our students can just go online, they download it. And then as they're downloading it, you know, we are getting them into the server and that's where all the stuff that I've set up behind the scenes really comes to play. Well, tell us a little bit more about it for anybody who's not familiar. Uh, I thought of Discord as a communication platform for video gamers. Like that's, again, my little knowledge of it. That's what I thought of. And like you said, that's expanding because it's not just for video gamers anymore. Uh, there's a lot more to it, but, and people would have some familiarity with like group chats or Facebook, or I don't know, different elements that are included in a discord, but tell us about like what that is. And especially for someone who has no idea what it is, what, what's all included there. What can you do? How are you using it? What does that look like? Yeah. So originally discord was designed for gamers. It was meant to be a place that gamers could go and connect with each other while playing whatever game they wanted to play. But over time, they realized, hey, there are schools using this, there are churches using this, and there are all these different ways for people to have a community, and it has nothing to do with games. They can be playing games or they don't have to. It's completely up to them because it's a free service that allows people to come together that has so much flexibility, so many ways to make it specifically what they need. So for us, I was able to go behind the scenes and set up what are called roles. So there are all these roles for people when they come into the server. So what happens is I want to allow a place for our students to come together, to gather and have community, but I want it to be safe. I don't know if you heard about all the crazy things that were happening with Zoom, like the Zoom bombs, people were showing up, hacking into servers. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. scary. And I'm like, I don't want that to happen to our kids. I mean, I love my students. I want them to be safe and protected, but I want them to have the opportunity to connect. So I knew it was something new that they had to learn. So I wanted to make it as simple as possible. I put together a webpage for them and the parents. I sent the parents a specific guide that said, hey, this is why it's important for you to have this for your kids. This is the details that comes into it. And on our website, we went through and I said, hey, this is what this looks like. This is why this is important. And it's so important to help them understand the why. So once they would get into our server, I would say download it and make an account. They make an account. They use the link that I send them. One of the cool things about Discord is you can't just go on and find anybody's server. 
you only can get to a server if you were sent an invite to that server. So I would give our students an invite into our server. And once they get in there, they would see this whole area that has all the rules. And they would get all these rules saying, hey, you, do you acknowledge that you're not going to bully people? You're not going to spam? You're not going to post anything inappropriate? And all these things that are just, you know, the basic standard rules that you'd want, even if you're meeting in person. And at the bottom of that list, they would have an option to be able to check off saying, yes, I read the rules. Now, this is what's neat. I was able to use a bot behind the scenes, and I say a bot, basically an automated moderator, all right? So, and the one that I use is called Carlbot, and I, you saw that on the screen that popped up. So, this automated bot basically can go in and give people roles based on what they click in the server. So, when someone comes into the server, by default, they're given a role that just says awaiting rule acceptance, meaning they haven't accepted my rules yet. At that point, they can't see anybody, they can't talk to anybody, all they can do is see the rules and one little section of the server that only I can see. Why? So that way, I don't have somebody who randomly found my link or somehow they got a hold of it, they can't come in and start messaging my students, it wouldn't be allowed. So once they accept that rule, they get the guest role. Now what does the guest role do? It lets them type to me. So now they can talk with me saying that they read the rules and part of the rules is they have to have their name that matches our system. So if they're a student that we've had before, we have them in our system. We know that this is somebody that we can relate to. And we say, hey, make sure you change your name. Make sure this is all set up. I double check it. I'm like, yep, I remember that student. There's the grade that that student is in. Yes, that is a middle school student. Now, once I give them the new role, they're able to go into the server and start seeing the text chat, the voice chat. They start to see our events, our discussion groups. We have uh, one of my favorite parts of the entire server. We have a prayer request section. They can go in there and just type in their prayer requests. People are, you know, reacting to those prayer requests saying, yep, I'm praying for that. I love this. Yo, we're helping you. I mean, the amount of prayer requests I see for people starting school right now has been, it's been a lot, but it's so cool to see these students gathering together. Now, I did have a few parents who said, well, I'd love to see the server as well. I want to make sure this is a safe place. So I was able to set up another role that said, hey, if you're a parent, click this button. Once they click that, they get the parent role, which allows them to see the different chats, but they can't type in the chats. They can't send messages to the students. All they can simply do is see, hmm, okay, there's nothing bad going on here. This is a safe place. Okay, I can trust my student to be a part of this. So it's been a really neat platform to really connect with the kids. We do typically weekly events with them. On Mondays, we do a Minecraft Monday where we actually have a separate Minecraft server that the kids just go on and they build whatever they want to build. And I've actually had the middle school students are moderating that for me, which is a lot of fun. They know way more about it than I do. But, you know, everyone saw I'll jump on and we'll play little games together or do scavenger hunts all in the game. And then on Wednesday nights, we'll do our groups on there. We say, hey, everyone jump into the discussion chat at this time. We're going to type in the questions you can answer on here or you can join us in voice or you can join us with video if you want. And we have that option. We did for a while Friday night game nights where I actually would do a screen share and we just would play trivia games and let their family be involved as well. And then of course we did our Sunday services and I don't actually stream it live into the service or into the server. I actually stream it onto YouTube and I let them watch it from there and then they respond while they're in the server. So it's a lot yeah. of stuff, but. Well, it's great. It sounds like it's a lot of the tools and apps that people are getting way more used to now, mm -hmm. all built into one. I mean, like when I shared my screen there, it looked like Slack channel on the side there with comments mm -hmm. and hashtags about what the topics were. I'm not sure if that's what that is, but that's what it looked like to me. And just, again, video chat, voice, like there's apps that do all these things from Vox mm -hmm. to Marco Polo to groups, or, you know, Zoom and Google Teams and uh, mm -hmm. things like that. But having all of this in one place that is highly controlled, obviously that's a key for you. That's what's great for you. Now, right. would you say uh, a lot of the students already had experience with Discord or no, this is kind of their, for, for most of them, their first impression to it. Like how much did you have to get them kind of on this platform versus how much were they kind of already there and now you're there too? Yeah, the ones who had it probably were the gamers. So any yeah. student that played games they're like oh yeah i know discord that's no problem i already have an account 
And they're the ones who are thriving so quickly because they had no learning curve. They already understood it. Whereas the other students, I had to help them understand it, which is why I put together that page that says, hey, here's how to log in. Here's how to get involved. Here's where the text channels are. Here's where the voice channels are, how to connect, disconnect, things like that. So there was definitely a learning curve for those students, but I have several students who had never touched it before who are online almost every single day. They're on there either playing games together now or they're just sending messages. I have one student that he doesn't play any of the video games, but he loves to just watch what some of the other students are playing. He'll just send his feedback. He'll post funny memes. I mean, like we'll do, I have every single day, there's a different theme for the day. So like me Monday. So every Monday, all the students get a chance to post all the memes. That way they can get it out and not do that all the rest of the week. And then, you know, Tuesday, we call it tacos Tuesday coming off of our believe event. So that's tacos for um, Thanksgiving adoration, confession, others and self. So a way of prayer. And we let them say, Hey, on Tuesdays, post in what you're thankful for in your prayer requests and all those moments. Wednesdays, worship Wednesday, they go through and they share worship songs. And it just goes on every single day. There's something else that they get a chance to participate in. So always there's something that they can communicate about, be excited about. It's just a really cool place. It's, I've been telling the parents, this is the youth group right now. If they were to come into the church doors, everything that we did on the church, in the church building, we're doing on the server. I mean, yes, we don't have nine square in basketball, but I mean, there are digital ways to have fun as well. So that's awesome. And what's the engagement like? I mean, I, again, if somebody's not used to Discord or doing anything on there that way, they could probably relate to a Facebook group or mm -hmm. even a Zoom call. Like a lot of student ministries were doing Zoom calls for groups or even the whole thing, or even streaming like you're doing uh, a service live on YouTube premiere for students. But again, there's this engagement piece, like how many of them are engaged, how many of them are sleeping at their computer, how many of them are not even there. Uh, for you, and I don't know if how you measured or what that looks like, what do you feel like engagement is like in the platform? Yeah, so something that I do love about Discord is it gives you the option to see the behind the scenes. So specifically with the bot that I use, I can have a separate channel. So that's what all those hashtags were. Those are like little channels that you can go to. There's a separate channel that is just for me to see. So no one can see that, but me or anyone else that I want to. So like other staff members of the church, I can give them access to this channel. And it'll be, for example, messages. All the messages get put into this channel. Anytime a message gets deleted, I still see what was deleted. So even if a kid said something and then tried to hide it, saying, no, I never said that, I would know. I, I can see that safety behind the scenes. Joining the voice chats, I can see when they joined the voice chat and when they left the voice chat. I can't hear it. I don't know what they said, but I at least know, hey, they jumped into a channel. So what that does is I have automatic attendance. I don't have to go keep track. I just look on there. Yep, those are all the kids that joined the channel. Boom, there's my attendance. So typically on average, I would say about 10 kids were consistently involved, which is not a lot. A lot of times there's different kids constantly. Um, at the same time, some of the better times I'd get up to like 20, 25 when we did some of our game nights. Of course, those are always the ones that they were most excited about. So the involvement is not as high as I wish it would be. But once again, the ones who are involved right now, they are just loving it so much. They are talking about how much of a difference it's making in their life right now. It's helping them understand how to have connection. They're staying involved. And then the ones who aren't showing up, honestly, I'm sad. I don't know what they're doing. I haven't, I've been trying to reach out to them. It's just difficult to keep up with all those different families other than just calling them constantly, which is what we're trying to do. So the yeah. more they can be involved, the better it is such an awesome opportunity for them, but they have to be willing to make the choice. We can't force them. Yes. Which is true overall, right? That's one of the things mm -hmm. that churches face. That's a challenge online is engagement can be good. Like it was for some people when COVID-19 hit and then online was the only option, but then it dropped fast. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? To where, okay, now engagement isn't as good. Barna's saying that, you know, back in June of 2020, it was like uh, a third, was it a third or something like that of church adults hadn't watched an online service in a month or something yeah. like that. And you're talking about church adults. And so, the, you know, th that wasn't new. You've got this platform. Some of the students are connecting well there. And I imagine it's a mix too. If it's 10 here, it's a different five, you know, a week or two exactly. from now. And then, you know, so collectively, you're probably getting a lot more uh, engagement there in a month. But then in a week, that's what you're seeing, which again is just like ministry in person. But uh, I love that you're exploring something new. 
trying out this platform. It does look like you said, a lot of things you would do in person, you can do there, which is awesome. So thanks for taking time to share with us. How can people connect with you if they have any questions? Yeah, so of course for our youth group, the best thing you can do is go to our website for harborsidechurch.org slash students. Um, or you can even check us out on YouTube, Harborside Students. That's where I have all my services where I'm going live right now. And for me personally, my website, Stephen M. Law. So M is in Michael. So StephenMLaw.com. And that's where I'm just basically using whatever I can to help people grow and make their best life out of everything that's going on. So. Cool. Well, you might get some emails and questions about how to set up a Discord server or something like that. Happy to so, help. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for taking time to share with us. All right. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.